Welcome to another episode of the Emetophobia Free Podcast. Today we are joined by Bree Billington, who is one of our Thrive Programme coaches, who has been on previous episodes of the podcast, but we're also joined today by her girlfriend, Sai. Hello, Sai, Hello. how are you? <laughs> I'm well, how are you? I'm good, thank you. It's lovely to have you here. Now, Sai is here for a very special reason. We're going to talk all about significant others today. So what a significant other is and how that person can support somebody with a metaphobia going through the program and how they can support them rather than collude with them. So Sai is here to talk all about that and um, the journey that her and Brie went on together in helping Brie overcome her emetophobia. Does that sound all right, guys? Yes. Yeah, it sounds good. So let's dive straight in. I'm going to leave it up to you guys. So what's your story? Where did you meet? How did the journey begin and when did, did the be, I know, when did the be introduced over to you guys um we met online actually we didn't actually go out to meet each other we met online and um things tinder a modern love story yes. <laughs> I met my husband on match, so well, you know, oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah we, we met on Tinder, and then we were on a date, and then just kept hanging out from there. So I was traveling a lot overseas, so she was kind of like back and forth a lot. Um, but yeah, we were kind of dating for a while before we started actually being in a relationship. I think uh, we we met, and the plan was that I was I was moving. That was my plan, like before yeah. before we met. So and we just kept hanging out and we just didn't want to stop hanging out so yeah we didn't want to stop hanging out which was really nice mm-hmm. so I ended up coming back to where we live yeah Perfect. yep <laughs> lovely <laughs> so where does emetophobia start to creep in when did you I know notice um, other things? so we were probably like a few months in and then I felt like this weight on me I was like I have to tell her like because it really I was like if I don't tell her like it my self-worth felt low and I was just like, I need to tell her that I have this because it could be like make or break. In my eyes, it was like this big, massive thing. And I was just like, if I had tell her and she doesn't accept it, what's that going to be like? So yeah. it was really frightening to tell you that I had a metaphobia. Yeah, I, I, for you it was frightening and for me I was like, oh, okay. Like, Yeah, it wasn't-, it wasn't really that big of a deal for you. But for me, I was like shaking like... Yeah. yeah, it was hard. And when someone prefaces it with it, like, uh, I've got something huge to tell you, you're yeah, like, oh, okay. Yeah, and I'm like, just like, <laughs> yeah. What have you done? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, Sai, had you noticed any little behaviours in Brie that, that were suddenly then explained when she said she had a metaphobia? Yeah, there was a few things that I'd noticed. I'd noticed, um, like, particularly, like, Oh, uh, like probably like around like eating times, like wanting to have like the television on and things like that um, yeah. to kind of like distract, distract me from looking at you, I think was the yeah. was the biggest thing. Um, I wasn't used to someone like not e- engaging with me while, while we're eating. Um, yes. Another thing was yeah. uh, conversations to start with, like just like anxiety wise that you didn't want to want to look at me, look me in the eye for a little bit. Yeah, I had trouble having eye contact with her um, yes. a lot of time. Yeah, especially if we were eating. Like if we were eating and she looked at me, I would just be like, she thinks I'm disgusting, like that I'm eating food because I would have, I would create a lot of anxiety like eating food, especially at nighttime because I was yeah. feeling sick and things like that. Um, and then to have her eyes on me as well, it was just too much. So I used to like want to put the TV on like full ball or like be like, can you not look at me when, we, when we're eating? Yeah. And then... It was just like, but why? Like, why? Yeah. So she didn't really understand that until afterwards. I pro- when I told you I had a metaphobia, I think like a lot of things would have. Yeah, a, a lot more things just kind of like, oh, like that, that, makes, that sense makes sense as to now. why yeah. I am that way. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I think I put a lot of it just down to like anxiety or like just like getting comfortable around me too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I was just giving her space to get comfortable yeah. around me. Um, yeah. And then, and then, yeah. Yeah, then you told me. Yeah, yeah. Then I told you. Okay. But yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't that big of a deal for her at all. And then, yeah, yeah. So I was going to say, what was your take on it? I've only been on Bree side of things and having to tell somebody that I had a metaphobia, and I'm similar to you, shaking, nervousness, horribleness. But the person I told also had a very similar re- reaction to you, Sai. Whereas it was a, oh, okay. 
pretty much a nothing. It, it was such a small thing to them. Um, so what was your reaction to ha- her having a metaphobia? Yeah, I think my reaction was more that like everyone has everyone has their things and this just happened to be her thing. Yes. Um, yes. I didn't see it as something she couldn't overcome from like right. the beginning. So I didn't I didn't see it as this like uh, like huge thing that, that she wouldn't be able to to get over. Um, I don't know if that was necessarily from like like uh, like not enough. Like I think I didn't understand fully like to start with like the amount of thoughts that go into it but also I think I always just I think I was very lucky to have like a mum that instilled with me like in me the belief that like you can do anything so I think it came from probably two two things like maybe not fully comprehending but also just thinking anything's possible as well yeah brilliant so was Brie when she told you was she aiming to get over it was she looking to get over it at that time or was she just trying to tell you to ease that anxiety in the relationship no, because I didn't really think that I could overcome it. And I think I told her, like, I have this, I think that was another big thing as to why I thought it was such a big deal to tell her. Cause I didn't think that I could overcome it based on like what I had read. It was like, yeah. you have to manage your symptoms or you have to do exposure. And I'm like, I don't want to do like either of those things. So I'm telling her that I basically have this thing forever for that limits yes. me so much. And for her, she loved to travel and she loved to do all these things. And I was just like, I don't want to take that away from her yeah. by like this okay. emetophobia. But then I did have that manual because I had it for three years and I told her and I was like, you can have a look at it, um, but yeah. this is supposed to like help. And then that's when she kind of just like had a look through it and was like, you need to do this because, um, you know, you have studied what you study. You study a lot of things to do with psychology. And then she read it and she was just like, this is going to help you. And she had that belief that like, no, you don't have that limitation to you, you can never overcome this. It's like you can do it if you, if you want to. So I think that's why you didn't see it as a, such a big thing because no. you're like it's a it's a choice kind of thing. I, I think I saw it as like a, a mindset thing because like yeah. uh, to like not like like it is a real thing but at the same time it's not a, it's not a real thing in that like you can change your, your yeah. thoughts around it. So I, I, I'd done a lot of like my own like personal growth over the, like the previous yeah. Like a couple of years. So I was thinking, okay, well, if I can change these thoughts and I've seen other people change those thoughts, I just had no reason to believe that Brie couldn't change her thoughts either. So, yeah. yeah and I think that was one thing that helped me so much too, was that she never doubted that I could overcome it. So, and then she was like the prime example of somebody who was like a thriving person. So I was like always around her and she always, her actions always reflected that like, yeah, you, you can overcome it because she had overcome challenges in her life and she was thriving. So I was like, I can do that too. Perfect. Perfect. So you briefly touched on, you said, well, you do what you do. So Sai, what do you do? What, why did you see the Thrive Program as something that you needed to, to do this? Uh, as to, as to uh, like- she's got a degree in pharmacy and physiotherapy, but then she does a lot of courses Outside of it outside well. of that, like she's always continually, continuing, continuing, continuing her learning. So, what are you learning at the moment? Um, I've done like some like a somatics course, and I've do like an EMDR course as well. So, fabulous! But that's yeah, only really- like it was all just like I think what, like when we first got together, that was all just like uh, like wanting to do in the future. But like that's happened in the last like what six months. Not even. Yeah, yeah, but you've done a. She's done a lot of like work on herself, you know, um, like self educated type things. Yeah. So I think that helped a lot with you understanding, like, kind of my mindset. I think I went down like a personal rabbit hole for a couple of years where, like, um, yeah. So yeah. it was really motivating to me when we yes. first got together. Yeah, that's brilliant. And you saw that reflected in the program when you picked up the book and thought, okay, I can see how this is going to help. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think I'd done a lot of like, I'd done a few courses around like beliefs and like limiting beliefs and things like that. And like, I think a lot of it comes like you can find like the root cause and whether the root cause is unlovable, unworthy or like fear or like whatever it happens to be, whether it's from trauma or phobia or whatever, it it didn't really make any difference to me. It all seemed like it was just all the same thing as just figuring out what the underlying thing is and how, how to get around it. 
Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And all the safety seeking and avoidance behaviors that she saw was just my way of coping with some kind of limiting belief that I had. So I think she saw it like that and it made it a lot easier for her to understand because she was never like, why do you think this way? Like it's irrational. Like she, she never made me feel like it was um, something to be ashamed of or something that she didn't understand, even though she didn't understand like how many thoughts I was actually having about it. Cause a lot of people you can kind of say like, Oh, I don't like being sick. And they're like, I don't like being sick either, but they don't actually understand like how many thoughts you think and how, you know, your decisions in the day are filtered through that limiting belief. But I feel like you actually understood that aspect of it, even though you didn't really like know what it's like. Yeah. So yeah. that was super helpful. Uh, like some ways, some ways I got it and other ways I just completely didn't yeah. get it. But We had a funny experience where we went um, on, it was like our one year anniversary and we stayed at this place and we were going for a hike. And then um, I was like, oh, we just hiked up this mountain and I had no anxiety And she was just like, why would you create any anxiety walking up a mountain? And I was just like, you have no idea. Like, I was like, what if I was like sick along the way? What if I touched something that was poisonous and it made me sick? What if I broke my leg? And I was just, I had all these things and it's like. Dehydrated, I was saying. Exactly, dehydrated. (laughs) I could have got, you know, even walking up that hill, I was so puffed. I was like, I felt a bit nauseous and um could have heap stroke like it could have been any like you know I catastrophize it could have been anything and she was just like it was just funny and I think it was fun like learning how our minds work like how thriving and how like um well she like has a perspective on things whereas I would just blow things and think of all these scenarios that were just like not crazy but like to me they were felt rational and that they could happen but for her she was just like why would you even think that so Yes. I think we had fun like learning how each other kind of thought in that way. Yeah. So that's a that's a nice tip, isn't it? That's not on our we've got a top five tips here that we're gonna go through shortly. But that's actually a really nice tip is for the significant other, in this case side, to get curious about yeah. the person's mind you know, and, and just try and understand and listen and have that open dialogue about what's going on. Because yeah. once you get curious in a in a really curious kind of way not in a trying to understand to fix just getting curious because yeah. at, at that point You've you were just trying to understand like it, that. Weren't you? yeah P- pardon I need the last bit sorry so it was it's just trying to get curious to to understand rather than trying to fix you were just trying to understand at that point you're going well what is going on for you rather than trying to mm-hmm. find sure. a solution for it yeah I think that's something you say about me a lot in like a general way as well not just about like a metaphobia is I'm always asking you yeah she's questions. always asking me questions to try and understand and she never saw it as like I'm somebody that has a metaphobia she's like you just have this one little aspect of yourself and yeah. she could see everything that I wanted to be which is really cool so she wasn't just like this is you. It's like, this is just one little part of you. So that was cool. Yeah, definitely. And completely contrasting to how you feel it felt about yourself, Brie, if you've ever felt like like my whole identity. That was it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This is me. I am a metaphobia. (laughs) It's not a tiny part at all. When in reality, that's completely right. It was a limiting belief that you were living your life through. So completely right. I love it. Right. Okay. So from the point in which you said, I've got a metaphobia, showed side the manual, when did the journey start to overcome it? When did you start to go into it? Um, I started reading it kind of straight away. And then um, it wasn't that long afterwards. I think it was a couple of weeks that I realized um, when I went through the sense of power and control. I think at that point it was locus of control where I realized that it wasn't due to that experience. It was due to how I'm like thinking about it and all my thinking styles and how I created it. And then that's when I went from you know, I can't cope to I can cope. And then from then on, I still read my manual every day now, but, um, and I still put in that work, but it just, it only took me a couple of weeks really. And I was seeing things completely differently and my life was just so much more enjoyable. We were doing so much more things. And I think that was something that was helpful too, is that we're always like planning camping trips and we're doing hikes and doing all these things. So I had a lot of opportunities to like practice that good in a voice and practice yes. um, challenging myself and processing it well. So I think that was really helpful I think it, for us to do. I think the difference too is that you got excited by the challenges. You're like, oh, yeah. like, this is the time where I get to like 
like yeah. challenge myself in doing this and I'm like yeah. yes I get to go do something with my girlfriend like it's yeah it's fun it didn't matter if, yeah it didn't matter if it was like you were pushing yourself and it was a challenge or it might not have gone 100 percent to plan like first go or anything like that it's yeah. the, the thing that we we're, we're getting out and we're doing things and it was fun yeah yeah, yeah. so it, did, it, it didn't really take that long really like once I started that manual um yeah it it was like oh this is a fun challenge now brilliant Love that. Right. Okay. So let's dive into the top five tips then. Yeah. And we'll just work through and get your take on it because obviously you guys have lived it, Sai's been on the other side of it, and it's a really lovely dynamic to see how that worked. Okay. So top tip number one for significant others, which is anybody at all who is supporting somebody trying to get over emetophobia, it doesn't need to be a partner. It can be a parent. It can be a friend. If you're supporting somebody else getting over emetophobia, then you can class yourself as a significant other. So top tip number one is don't collude. So first of all, we need to know what colluding is. Okay, so colluding is buying into, in some way, shape or form, their belief system. So agreeing with them that being sick is terrifying and that they should avoid these things. And you are, in some way, shape or form, helping them maintain that fear, okay, and that belief. Yeah, she never once colluded with me at all. So I never even gave her the tear out or anything like that, which um, was handy. But yeah, if someone colludes with you, it's almost like they're agreeing that there's something to be scared of. So if I was ever saying to her, you know, I'm having a panic attack because I'm worried that, you know, that dinner that we went out to is making me sick. And she was just like, oh yeah, like, yeah, being sick is the worst thing in the world. Like I can understand why you're like feeling so panicked. And um, she, yeah, she didn't do that, but that's what colluding could look like to somebody. You're almost agreeing that they're, they have a right to be, you know, afraid yes. about something. Yes. Um, but, yeah, she she was never like that. No, I think it was, like, nearly the opposite. Yeah, she she was the opposite. She I was think- definitely a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So, what, yeah. so what, what, what did that look like then? If you went out, <clears throat> excuse me, for a meal and you were then panicking later on, what mm-hmm. was your reaction, Sai? How did you support and not collude in that moment? I think it would depend on how, like, how Brie was at the time. I think it would depend on, like, her, like, how panicked she was. So is she in the state where she can accept a challenge or is she Mm -hmm. in the state where she just needs support? Um, If she needs support, then that's that's what I offer. If it's, um, if she's in the point where she needs a challenge, it's like, well, if you do get sick, it's your body's way of um, protecting you. It's your body's yeah, way of yeah. coping. I, I always say to you, rid the demon. Rid like, the demon, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> if you get sick, it's like the, the best thing for you. But yeah. um, And like, you'd be like, you're like, I'm sick all the time and it's completely fine. And But then if I was in, you know, if I was having an anxiety attack, like she, I would just come out in like shakes like she could yeah. she could tell that and she knew that wasn't the time she would really help me like breathe and try and um relax myself and then we would yeah. pick that up later and be like okay like what was going on like how can we challenge that now so we would always kind of come back to it but she was really good <laughs> at like knowing like yeah when to challenge and when to actually like support me love that brilliant I love that okay so Top tip number one is don't collude. So that's in any way that you're agreeing that being sick or this fear is like um, rational or warranted. Yeah. Or It could also look like, actually, sorry, it, it could also look like if somebody wants to avoid something, you saying that, yeah, it would be too hard for you to do that. Like yes. don't come out for dinner. Like you would create anxiety if you come out for dinner. Why don't we just stay home? Kind of like yes. you're agreeing that they can't do it or it's too hard or there's something to be scared of. So Yes, and when you've got emetophobias, you sometimes build the belief that you are different to everybody else. I'm just going to think about part of my own story. When I used to go away with my friends, we'd go away once a year on a, on a little trip, like a weekend away, and I would always buy my own food. So everybody else would just pitch in, put some money in, go and buy enough to make a big chili or something like that, and I'd be like, I'm going to have a pizza, right? <laughs> and they would always question and go, are you sure you don't want a chili? You know, but at that point, they could have gone, okay, well, yeah, you have your pizza, that's fine. You know, it might be too hard for you to eat the chili. That's still colluding. That's still allowing me to think, yeah, okay, I'm different and, and, I, and I'm and yeah. i warranted in what I'm doing. And actually it might make me sick. Everyone else will be fine, but it might make me sick. And it's buying into that belief system. So any way that you can not do that and you can continually challenge 
And it's it, it's a tough it's a tough job, Si, isn't it? When you are well, I don't know. Is it a tough job when you are supporting somebody with it and having to challenge their thinking all of the time? <laughs> I think like, uh, I think initially it can be, I think it can be because it is consuming. So Mm -hmm. if it's someone's uh, like a hundred percent of their thoughts, it's a hundred percent of their thoughts. You can't, you can't change that. So in a relationship, it sometimes doesn't leave a lot of space for another person. So I think um, like, just be prepared that there's, there's days that there's a lot of thoughts and there's days where you're doing that, but it's, it's, it's definitely weighed out. Like it's weighed out by like, like all the all the positives yes because like, it is it's, it's such a little part and it's completely possible to to move past so yeah. I mean, yeah yeah I didn't think I'd hear like the word emetophobia so much in my life <laughs> <laughs> no and it's a, a short space of time I suppose if you if the person is really dedicated to getting over emetophobia then it's a short space of time in which you are continually challenging because eventually their thoughts yeah. change they become more powerful and they don't have those thoughts anymore so you're not continually challenging and then you just have this beautiful relationship afterwards yeah, so, yeah. and I think she could see how hard I was working and how much I was challenging myself it wasn't just like I was laying around like you know panicking all the time and being like I can't do anything about it um yeah. I think if I had that type of energy you wouldn't have stuck around for that because she had a life that she wanted to live and I wanted to live it with her and I was like I really want to do this you would support me when I was having, you know, the panics, but you could see that how much I was, like, trying. Well, you, you were also panicking because you were putting in effort to challenge yourself, like, in, yeah. in like, the initial stages. Yeah. It's not like you were, yes. like, yeah, so I, I could see all the effort that you were putting in and it wasn't, like, it was just, like, one little aspect of, like, kind of our, our lives weren't aligning when yeah. everything else was aligning so well, then, of yes. course, you're going to be patient to, to get yes. to that point to aligning too. And, look, like, it's, yeah, yeah. it's paid off now. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Same. That's exactly the same with my story. I think Richard had exactly the same conversation with me and it's like, it's just a little part that we just need to get through because we're, we're, you know, you have this lovely relationship afterwards. You've just got to get through that bit. So it's worth yeah. it, isn't it? Supporting that person. Yeah. Okay. So top tip number two then would be to help them gain perspective. Now for significant others or people who are supporting people with a metaphobia listening to this podcast, it's really hard, I think, sometimes to understand the perspective of somebody with a metaphobia because it is generally very distorted and very warped. Yeah. So they can be looking at going into a restaurant and all they see is danger. I mean, there's, there's just danger everywhere. There's, there's things that are going to make them sick, left, right and centre, and it's absolutely terrifying for them. And for somebody without a metaphobia who doesn't have those distorted thoughts, it's really hard to see that perspective. So when we're saying... Top tip number two is help them gain perspective. It can be a really difficult thing to do because the person's emetophobia perspective is so vastly different to the person without emetophobia. So I wanted to chat a little bit about how Sai helped Brie gain perspective when she lost perspective sometimes. Do you have any examples of that? Um, Just... Kind of what I touched on before, that she was just, um, her actions reflected like everything that she was saying. So she's not somebody that's scared of being sick. She's somebody that can manage her emotions really well. And I think just like watching her, um, I kind of mimicked that in a way. Um, yeah. Trying to think. So if you were just, so, you know, in the early days when you said you were doing challenges, you were going out and enjoying things, there will have been, I'm guessing, times, Brie, where you're thinking, oh, God, I really want to do that. But I'm really scared right now because what if this and what if that and what if, you know, and you were catastrophizing. So in that, in those moments, how did Sai? I I didn't really, I don't think I really told her many, I don't think I really told her unless I was in kind of, like I've created a lot of anxiety. I think most of the time I was relying on myself to, um, you know, challenge those thoughts because, you know, just from reading the manual, like you need to rely on yourself, like not somebody else. I think it, it was just like watching her. And I think if I did tell you like, oh, I'm worried. I'm trying to think because there's so many examples. Like um, I remember saying like weird things like I don't want to eat noodles and drink blue Powerade at the same time because the idea of those things mixing like makes me feel weird or whatever. And she would just bring me straight down to earth and just feel like, what are you talking about? Like, the- <laughs> I, I, I think I think the good one, like I remember this one, when Alaska went on um, – uh, like a, a whirly ride yes and, that's a good one. and she she got she was sick like the the following day 
And then I was at a carnival, like with Brie and Alaska, and I want I wanted to take her on the ride again, and she wanted to go on the ride. It looked like yeah. fun. And Brie was like, <laughs> Brie was like, no, no, because last time she got sick. I was like, yeah, she got sick the next day the, after she had, day. was on that ride. Yeah, she yeah. she got delayed motion sickness. Yeah, like, she was like, yeah, she got delayed motion sickness and made a joke of it. And I was like, oh yeah, like you're totally right. Like that yeah. that those two things were completely unrelated, and I was going to stop like my daughter going on a ride. So, yeah, it's in moments like that where she says things and I'm just like, oh, yeah, like that's completely not right. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a really nice, that's a nice testament to your relationship because if you can, you know, that was a, a genuine thought that Brie had, but you were able to uh, dissolve that almost with, with humour and lightheartedness and being yeah. able to take it, you know, and not, not getting frustrated and not getting mad and just taking it as it comes which is really nice I don't think she's ever you've never been frustrated or mad at me at all no 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 No. because it's not coming from a place of like it's only coming from her place of like concern so how can you be mad at someone for being concerned for themselves or yeah someone else like that's yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. so I suppose another tip that's not on there but a, a small tip is to stay patient with the person who's going through emetophobia and the person who's trying to overcome it because they will have, you know, that that was a distorted thought. It's delayed motion sickness, right? Which, yeah, but Brie had never <laughs> thought about that <laughs> at the time. But, you know, th- thoughts like that are very regular and, and quite frequent when you have emetophobia. Um, yeah. So staying patient and having that that time and giving them that grace to talk through it with them and to, to make light of it if possible is really helpful as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, if you can make it fun, that's um, a good way of doing it because you, you are filled with a lot of fear. So if somebody can bring you down to earth, like in a fun way, um, yes. that's definitely helpful. Perfect. Lovely. Right. Okay. So tip, top tip number three then would be to help them build coping skills. Now, part of the program is all about coping skills, quite a big part of the program. And we can do that in areas that are unrelated to emetophobia sometimes so you can just do challenges together potentially go on like you were saying go on fun trips try new things together because what that person is then doing with emetophobia is realizing that they can tolerate discomfort so I'm just thinking of an example off the top of my head say you go abseiling together that takes coping you've got to coach yourself through that if you're not used to abseiling you've got to work through that and it, it builds your coping skills so it sounds like you guys did a lot of that yeah, we did a lot of that. Um, we used to go camping a lot, but we started getting into hiking and we had a goal yeah. to go hiking through the Blue Mountains. So we were training for that and that was going really well. Um, yeah, I think I would, like camping, camping was a challenge. Camping was a big one because, um, you know, it's like you don't have access to like clean water sometimes. Um, yes. The toilets, yes. I like drop toilets, you have to cook with the food that you have um um being in like noisy places because initially you thought if you couldn't sleep that you'd be unwell yeah yeah um because I used to get insomnia a lot especially if there was anyone camp near us and I could just hear them like partying and things like that I would just be laying there with like listening being hyper vigilant being like is a people too drunk are they going to be sick near our car um are they going to be sick in the morning I'm going to see them um so I think camping was a really good one because it kind of hit like so many things that yeah. were scary to me. Um, but now we can go camping and it's it's so fun. Like I don't have any of those thoughts now. Skating? You you were and like skating? Yeah, I started skateboarding when um, it said to pick up a hobby as well. So Sai would come with me to watch me skate as well, which was um, which was good. What else did we do? We did surfing rollerblading rollerblading like any yeah. kind of outdoor like outdoor, outdoor. Activity. we've started running together now nice. and we're about to start learning how to play the drums together like we're we're constantly um thinking of ways to um do new things which is fun yes it's really fun so can you explain then Brie from from your perspective why those things doing all of those things because people listening to this might be thinking well how's that going to help somebody get over emetophobia going camping or roller skating yeah. or how, how is that yeah, related? Okay. so how how did it help you on your journey yeah so if it, if we're unrelating it to emetophobia um because we know that it's not really about you know being sick it's about yeah. being able to tolerate uncomfortable emotions and so if you can challenge yourself in other ways that aren't related to it it's a really 
good first step in challenging your emetophobia. So um, just say like for me going skateboarding, it was challenging my social anxiety and a fear of like hurting myself at the same time. So I had to really try and be kind to myself to be like, no, you can do this. Like it might be scary, like tolerating anticipation, anxiety, um, and then just like processing it well afterwards that I did something that felt uncomfortable um, and it was completely fine and I did it. So, Perfect. Yeah. and then building it up to, you know, my safety seeking, which is, um, you know, going camping that tested a lot of those things in terms of like germs and food and being around people. So then taking those skills there to be like, no, I know how to um, tell myself that I can do this and yeah, challenge it in that way. And then to have her with me as well, which was good. I was, I was just about to say that because all of those things are brilliant, but you did them all alongside your significant other. So it wasn't actually Sai building your coping skills for you, but she was helping by being there. She was helping by supporting and by encouraging you to do those things. Yeah, yeah, she's super encouraging. So it's nice. And it's nice to know that like if I was – if I did create a lot of that anxiety where I had completely lost perspective, I know that I could tell her and she she could bring me back down by, um, yeah, giving me the evidence of what I'm actually experiencing is not that reality that I think it to be. <laughs> yeah. So can you think of an example of that? Because that's a really nice little thing you just said there. Yeah, I, had, I have one. So when I was skating, a thing that um, I used to think about was I was worried about the people around me falling off and concussing themselves and then being sick oh. because I would link I would link them all together as like how how can this situation be linked to a metaphobia and like how can yes. I keep myself safe? So I used to watch people that were like doing tricks at the skate park and one person fell over. And then he was like crawling towards the grass because he had like hit his like hip or something. He looked like he was in heaps of pain. And instead of me being like, I hope that guy's all right, I'm like, is that guy going to be sick because he's just, he's in heaps of pain over there. He's crawling towards the grass. And I was saying to Sai that I wanted to go home because I was really like worried that this guy was going to be sick. And then I remember you saying like, no, he's just hurt himself. Like it's completely fine. Like bringing me back down to earth that, you know, those things are so far away from each other. And even if it did happen, like, it, I'm going to be fine. I kept on skating and um, yeah. I was completely fine. And that was a really good one because um, I see people hurting themselves all the time now. And it's just something that I now can challenge and be like, oh, no, that doesn't mean that they're going to be sick. And even if they were, like, now I could go over and be like, are you okay? Like, yeah, no. But I don't instantly think they're going to be sick. I think they've just hurt themselves and they're moving out of the way because that's maintaining the normal perspective. That's that's the reality of the situation. Yes. In my yes. head, it was something completely different. Yes. So that links point number two and three beautifully together because what Sai was doing there is not only helping you build coping skills by supporting you in your building up skating and all that kind of stuff, but she was helping you gain perspective at the same time. So if something yes. happened, you would then say, I want to go home, and she would help you gain that perspective. So that's another... Another one that links hits both of those points. So that's great. Yes. Yeah, fabulous. Lovely. Okay, which leads us nicely onto point number four, tip number four, which is know when to challenge and know when to distract. And what's the difference? Because that's a big one for people who are supporting people with emetophobia, um, especially if they've been in the habit of colluding beforehand. So people yeah. tend to collude because they're just trying to support. They don't know how else to support that person. So speaking from my own example um my mom would always yes okay we, we will not do that we can avoid that we won't go there you don't need to eat that it would always be very much a supportive but coming purely from a place of love she wanted to support yeah. me. she didn't want me to see me in any distress so she was trying to protect me from that distress but unfortunately that was just colluding with me in that my it built the belief in me then that I was I actually had to avoid those things and I actually couldn't eat those things and it maintained it so when something like that happens and the person loses perspective, it's important that the significant other weighs it up. You touched on it briefly earlier. When to challenge and when to go in there and, and help them gain that perspective straight away or when to distract, when they're too far gone. So do you have any experience of that or any examples you can give? 
I was always kind of creating some kind of anxiety and I'd always kind of lost perspective in some way. So I think it's up to you whether you, like, you knew when to yeah, challenge I, me. I think like when it's like internal for yourself, you might not be able to feel it, but you like feel it like in parenting when you know it's like cuddle versus lesson. It's like just looking yes. at like dysregulation. And it's, I think it's no different like in, in anyone. Yeah. You can tell if someone's completely dysregulated or like able to cope with what you're saying or not and if you're panicked if you're like having a hard time it's 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 not the time to make it harder yeah but if you're in the in the mindset where it's like okay well like you know it's like you're not completely lost touch with like everything that's actually like happening you, you can challenge yeah yeah I think um let me I'll have and a when I was like yeah when I was kind of having panic attacks because I would have them quite regularly like in the beginning before I did the manual um I would really be shaking and she could tell like I was not having a good time I was just like yeah I was creating a lot of anxiety so for her in that moment to just be like you know like you'd be fine um yeah yeah, it, it wouldn't be a helpful thing for me to to hear because I wouldn't believe that at that point um there was it felt like there was no longer like a rational part of me so um I needed her to be able to like you would breathe with me um and we would do all these little things to try and like relax myself down and then we would always come back to it later to just be like what was going on like what was the thoughts that you had like before that happened so then we can prevent that from happening again or I know like what to do, you know, yes. to lessen yeah. it the next time. And I think like for, for me, like the big picture is, is always wanting Brie to like her, her goal was to be a metaphobia free. So that, that became my goal for her too. So the yeah. big picture of that is, is like in that moment, what gets her closer towards her goal. So yeah. um, like, like, colluding with you doesn't get you closer to the to your goal even though in that moment it might like it might have felt it might feel like the 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 more supportive thing to do is to do that um and the same with like challenging you when like how does that get you to the to the goal of being a metaphobia free versus when you need comfort because if I challenge her in the times where she needs comfort and support instead it's going to make her feel like she's further away from that goal yeah um, if she feels like she can't get there in that moment yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Really good point. Really, really good point. So, suppose when you were panicking or dysregulated, as you beautifully put it, Zai, then everybody's come down, if you will, is different. So, breathing techniques are brilliant. In that moment, if you've lost perspective, if they're panicking, breathing with them, meeting them on their level, getting down if they're on the floor, get on the floor with them and breathe with them. Yeah. Um, are there any other techniques that you that you did? Um. We did like we did like like chest to chest like regulation together breathing together. We did like the the vu breath, the vu breath, yeah, where um, you breathe in, and then you're like vu. because I would shake. Yeah. So yes. um, if she could tell that I was before I was getting to that point, that was another way that we did where I would just do the vu and like feel the vibrations and. Um, that really helped me because I was kind of like focusing on doing something else too. Yes, um, yes. We, yeah. so we like we do the shaking together. Shaking together, yeah. Or we'd go out for a walk or... Um, yeah. 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 Let's say walk was, the walk was mine. It was, I, I need to get up and move. That was, <laughs> I, I needed to, that's when I was panicking. It was a, okay, I need to go for a walk now. Let me get outside, fresh air, that kind of thing. So all of that is beautiful if the person's lost perspective. But key is what you said just then always come back to it so once they are regulated again once they are calm once they have got perspective back it's then going back to it and going right what can we learn from that so let's look at what Mm -hmm. happened let's look at the thoughts you brought into how you got yourself into that panic in that state and let's work through it and how you could do things differently next time and do that with them yeah that conversation yeah yeah and we kind of yeah and then we figured out like based on when I would have these panic attacks like what actually helped me in that moment because I didn't realize that um the things that we did would have would have actually calmed me down so I think finding a way to if if your partner is in a really panicked state like what's actually going to help them feel relaxed 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then come back to it and challenge it. So if you can't challenge and it, and then the come moment, back to it, come back to it. Yeah. Because if you don't, yeah, come back you don't to want it, to get it to that forward. point. <laughs> Yes. No. Yeah. yeah. If, if you, you can avoid us. getting it to that point, that's good. But I know for yeah. a lot of people that have emetophobia, like they they do work themselves up into a panic yeah. attack, and yes. it's good to be yes. able to um, find what works for you. And if you can get your partner to help you, so you can relax yourself quicker, so then you can yeah. start challenging it and working yeah. through it. Um, and, to yeah. and that was your goal as well. It was like never to be like panic attack free, or never to yeah. be like yeah. like uh, yeah have have no reaction. It yeah. was to be like, okay, like how can we work through it? Like how can we yeah. how can we Yeah, how can I have the tools? And now that I have the tools, I don't have panic attacks anymore. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It goes hand in hand, doesn't it? So I suppose yeah. when you are another key thing for the significant other to be picking up on are those cues that you're heading into a panic attack, if you can see them. I know some people go straight in and it's like a head first into a pothole kind of thing. <laughs> and it's, it's very, very quickly. Uh, but some people will have, they'll show signs and they might go with quiet or withdrawn or, you know, uh, like avoiding eye contact. And they'll, you'll just see them withdraw and go within themselves a little bit. And mm-hmm. at that point, if you can pick that up in your significant other and start to question them at that point, that might just help them and catch them. And you can challenge those thoughts, help them gain perspective, possibly with humour, before they then get in themselves into a panic attack, that's another good skill to yeah. have as a significant other. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, I was just thinking with that also, maybe if you are um, in a relationship and you don't want to tell the person that you are kind of having a panic attack, like if you have been doing really well, sometimes there's shame around like, oh, I'm, I'm not doing um, as good as I thought or I'm having a little blip and – you kind of don't want to admit that, um, you know, you're creating that anxiety because it might like make them feel like disheartened in a way or something like that. So I think it is important to have like that open communication to be like, oh, like I know I've been doing really well, but I'm creating some anxiety now. And for them to not just be like, oh no, like um, your emetophobia is back or, um, you know, I never felt like if I told her that I was creating anxiety that she would just be like, oh, no, like, here we go again. Um, yes. It wasn't like that. It didn't It didn't define me at all. Right. Um, it didn't mean that I had anxiety or anything like that. It just means that, like, I could create anxiety sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I think I could relate that to myself as well. I, I Towards the end when you have lowered your social anxiety enough and you've got that understanding of yourself enough, to be able to say, okay, if you're going into somewhere new, I, I think I was going into the Trafford Centre, which is a shopping centre in Manchester with my husband at the time. And I, said, and I was walking in and I was thinking I was generating all these really unhelpful thoughts and creating some anxiety. And I said to him, okay, I'm generating some anxiety right now. I'm just going to have five minutes. I'll just give me five minutes. Can we just sit here? And that was all I needed. He, didn't need, he, he sat on his phone. He didn't even need to do anything. <laughs> I just needed the time and the space to be able to bring myself back around and to focus. And having him just sat there, saying nothing was enough you know yeah so you're completely right by not going oh here we go again oh why and sometimes the significant other doesn't need to intervene especially towards the end of the program because that person has the skills themselves physically being present and allowing them that space is enough sometimes of course yeah yeah fabulous lovely okay so last tip then for significant others is to help them feel powerful as an individual now what we don't want to Uh, get across by doing this podcast is that the significant other is getting the person with emetophobia over their emetophobia because in fact they're not all they're doing is supporting they're a passenger they're a passenger in that car it's the person with emetophobia doing the driving they're the one getting themselves over this thing so anything that the person supporting can do to highlight to the person with emetophobia that it is in fact them They're doing it. They're the one that's made the progress, reminding them of all of the progress that they've made, you know, articulating that to them, that it's you doing this and reinforcing that, helping them feel powerful as an individual is really helpful. Mm 